When you look at the Earth from space, you don't see 200 plus squabbling countries. And when you look deeply into nature, you don't see separate academic disciplines and departments. And that's why it's so important for us to be unapologetically interdisciplinary when we approach our grand challenge problems. I have a deep sense of urgency about solving our grand challenge problems, like climate change, renewable energy, poverty, illiteracy, environmental degradation, and pandemic disease. These are massive problems, and they require scalable solutions. Solutions like exponential technologies that double in price performance every 18 months to two years. Technologies like artificial intelligence and robotics, fueled by information technology. All of us are surfing in front of a massive tsunami wave of information. 1.8 zettabytes of information, 10 to the 21st bytes. That is a very different information environment than what we evolved out of. And we have both an opportunity and a problem. The opportunity is that we have massive amounts of information now to solve our problems, and the problem is we have a very ancient information processing device. The brain hasn't had a major upgrade in over 50,000 years. And if your laptop or your smartphone hadn't had an upgrade in, say, five years, you might be a little concerned about that. So we are going to have to augment our brains with artificial intelligence. And let me just quickly run you through some of these applications that have already been developed. In fact, if you flew in to San Miguel, you flew in with the aid of artificial intelligence, both in the cockpit and in the air traffic control center. For the past 35 years, we've had applications of AI in medicine, and now artificial intelligence is entering the mainstream of medicine through the electronic medical record and clinical decision support systems. The $10 million Tricorder X Prize, sponsored by Qualcomm, is for the team that first develops an AI that can diagnose and provide therapy recommendations for people in the field based on a mobile device. And there are already 230 teams worldwide that are competing for this prize. So you can count on it. It will happen, and sooner than you think. British Petroleum developed a VIDE system, a visual pattern recognition system, to identify the microfossils that are associated with deep ocean oil deposits. They've already saved tens of millions of dollars per year with this system. And AIs have been the cutting edge of games for many years now, and not just shoot 'em up games like Call of Duty, but here we have Fate of the World, where you as the user are put into the hot seat of a world in crisis, and you have to manage resources and deal with pandemics and illiteracy and war. Many of you may have noticed that IBM's Watson AI beat the two world champions in Jeopardy in the word game just recently. Let me give you a sense of what it's like to play against a artificial intelligence. But keep in mind, this is not your enemy. This artificial intelligence is going to be harnessed for medical problem solving in the very near future. They're already working on it. Take a look at this. Can you're in the first position? Raise the level. Selection. Oh, I've never said this on TV. Chicks dig me for 200, please, Jimmy. <laughs> Kathleen Kenyon's excavation of this city mentioned in Joshua showed the walls had been repaired 17 times. Watson. What is Jericho? Correct. 400, same category. This mystery author and her archaeologist hubby dug in hopes of finding the lost Syrian city of Urkesh. Watson. Who is Agatha Christie? Correct. Watson? Who is Mary Leakey? You're right. Watson? What is Crete? Yes. Let's finish Chicks Dig Me. <laughs> <laughs> and Mount? 
And I'll point out that Watson didn't just win that game of Jeopardy, it trounced the competition by a factor of three. So if we look under Watson's skull, what do we find? 2,880 core processors in 90 servers, 16 terabytes or trillion bytes of data, and 80 teraflops or 80 trillion logical operations per second. And what's significant about that? That it's going to double in price performance every 18 months to two years. Massive amounts of problem-solving power. How many of you have an iPhone with Siri on it? Several of you do. Siri is the result of a Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency project called Kalo, the cognitive assistant that learns and organizes. And Siri is just the beginning of a new class of associate systems that can help you develop and deliver your everyday tasks. It's just the beginning. Here's Google's version of an assistant technology called Google Now. And the goggles are part of Project Glass, developed by Google's research arm, Google X. And AIs have been built into robots, like the Now robot, pictured here. And in fact, this robot replaced the Sony Ibo robot dog as the champion international RoboCup player. And in fact, it's a very competent soccer player. This is the Hansen Robotics Robokind robot, the R50. It can emulate 32 different human facial expressions. It has 33 degrees of freedom. It's quite an extraordinary device. It looks like a toy, but it isn't. And this is a breakthrough in industrial robotics. The gentleman you see there is Rodney Brooks, who developed this Baxter robot for $22,000, just announced a few months ago. Baxter can learn industrial tasks in under 30 minutes. That's a real breakthrough. And it will change our ability to do manufacturing locally all over the world. This is the Google autonomous car. It's driven over 300,000 miles around Mountain View, Palo Alto, and other places with a great safety record. I've been a passenger in the back of this robot car and felt completely relaxed and, and comfortable. One day, we'll look back and think, what were we thinking getting behind the wheel of a car with our ancient brains? This is a job for a robot. And in fact, these systems are going to save time, they're going to save money, and they're going to save lives. We murder 32,000 people in the U.S. alone annually and 1.2 million people around the world. And these systems are going to prevent those deaths. Robotics can scale from the macro scale to the micro scale and over the next two decades to the nano scale. We can't yet program atoms in three dimensions and put them exactly where we want them with atomic precision. But we will learn to do that. That's called molecular nanotechnology and we will have molecular manufacturing. We'll be able to make precise objects very small and also very large, like redwood trees and whales. And when we have this technology, it will fundamentally alter our relationship with molecules and matter, like the computer altered our relationship with bits and information. Specifically, it will blow the roof off. Computers and access to the internet made us information billionaires. And this technology can usher in an age of abundance. Artificial intelligence is also going to transform education. Many of you have heard of the One Laptop Per Child project. You've heard of the Khan Academy and Udacity, Coursera, edX. Those are still broadcast technologies today. But AI will transform education when we have not just one laptop per child, but one tutor per child or adult learner. A tutor that can model the individual learner model the domain, like calculus, and close the gap between what the learner needs to know and how they need to know it. 
This is Darmendra Moda, who heads up the Synapse project at IBM Almaden. This project is building, and in fact has built, a neuromorphic chip that has 262,000 simulated neurons on it. It is the beginning of a transformation from, trip, from chips being just calculating machines to learning devices. And in fact, this is going to usher in a revolution in computing. The circular diagram that you see there is the, a map of the McKay monkey brain, 383 different regions of the McKay monkey brain. And when we finally do build an artificial neocortex, we won't just stay within the confines of the current skull parameters. If you unravel our skull and look at the neocortex surface area, it's about the size of a large dinner napkin. And once we learn how to build artificial neocortexes, we can build them the size of this room, or the size of San Miguel, or Mexico, or the continent, or the planet. And why would we want to build massive AI systems like that? Because we need to deal with the accelerating wave front of human knowledge. None of us can master more than four or five disciplines. That's quite a challenge at the rate that things are changing today. And you can see from this diagram that human knowledge is moving forward on multiple fronts with accelerating speed. It will take AIs to be able to master these domains and the edges, the interdisciplinary areas that are the sources of innovation. We'll be able to use the NASA Hyperwall 2 system, 128 individually addressable panels that can also be configured to work together, or immersive environments where we can interact with our AIs and our massive amounts of data. We can build a planetary skin with billions of sensors and massive processing power. Some of you may be concerned about this technology becoming surly or malevolent or worse, and it's reasonable to be concerned about that. But it won't be a black swan event that just comes in from left field. We know that we have to be proactive about managing these technologies. So I believe that there are three kinds of literacy that are required for us to manage these technologies responsibly. And they include mathematical literacy, ecological literacy, and ethical literacy. Let's start with mathematical literacy. Let's say that I can step about a meter with each step. And if I take 30 steps, you know where I'll be. I'll be about 30 meters away. But if I take 30 exponential steps, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, and I take 30 of those steps, I'm at over a billion. What is that? What is a billion meters? It's 26 times around the circumference of the Earth. Let's take another example to sharpen your intuition. Imagine a lake about 15 kilometers in diameter, and it has a lily pad, a tiny little lily pad that doubles in size every day until on the 30th day it takes over the entire lake. On what day will the lily pad be halfway across the lake? It's not the 15th day, it's the 29th day. And I've made a little simulation here and started it not on the 15th day, because you can barely see the lily pad at that time. I've started it on day 26. And you can see that on day 26, when you see this little green dot there, it doesn't look like it's much of a problem, but after all, we're on day 26. There's day 27. Still time to in intervene. Day 28. Day 29. Game over. So the significance of that is you really have to be on your toes, both to take advantage of the opportunities of exponential technologies and their potential risks. We don't have time to uh, get into ecological literacy in a deep way. Let me just mention an exemplar of ecological literacy. This is someone I worked full time with for four years. It's Dr. Barry Commoner, who wrote The Four Laws of Ecology, six books, 300 scientific papers. He drafted the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, and his work is in the Smithsonian Institution. I commend his work to you. Barry died about a month ago. 
at the age of 95, and that makes me very sad. But I'm more sad for those of us left behind with decision-making systems that are largely obsolete, ecologically illiterate, often corrupt, and really not up to the task of managing the challenges of the 21st century, much less really blowing the roof off of what we could create if we had our act together. Let's talk about ecological literacy. It will involve inclusiveness, developing empathy for all kinds of sentient beings. And it also involves extending that empathy so that our behavior is changed when we can abuse our power and we don't. Does anyone know who these distinguished gentlemen are? They're the defendants in the Nuremberg trial. These guys murdered 10 million of their fellow human beings without any remorse. And nobody questioned their intelligence. So it's not enough to build powerful analytical AI. We have to build in ethics and morality. These guys were ethical morons. But these people, the tobacco executives, managed to be involved in companies complicit in killing over 100 million people in the 20th century, and they lied to Congress about the addictiveness of cigarettes and their cancer-causing potential. So we really need to make sure that even if uh, we have uh, otherwise distinguished people, that they take their ethics very seriously. Here's Ken Lay and his colleagues at Enron, who considered themselves the smartest guys in the, in the room. I often tell my students at Singularity University, if that's the best that we can do with human intelligence and AI, we might as well go home. So we need to transform decision-making. I just have time to give you one quick example. NASA is a very smart agency, and it made a mistake in 1986. It decided to launch the shuttle Challenger mission in spite of getting information from a lowly engineer that the O-rings on this system might fail under cold conditions. They also were worried about loss aversion. They had a bunch of VIPs. They had delayed the launch several times. They didn't want to keep delaying it. So they decided to push the button and go for it. And 73 seconds later, they killed these seven outstanding astronauts, including the first teacher in space. And the significance of this, in addition to the tragic loss of life, an avoidable loss of life, was that NASA reviewed its decision-making procedures, and they've gotten a lot better. But I can tell you that our Congress hasn't learned the same lessons. And they don't get the, the advantage of 73 seconds to feedback on their bad decisions. If they're making decisions about climate change, and the decisions take 20 or 25 years to see the bad effects, we're really going to have to modify how they do business. What we want to do is to move forward with exponential technologies and keep the lights of innovation burning. We want to not just solve problems, we want to use our creativity and curiosity to create the future boldly. Consider this postcard of a self-portrait of our curiosity robot back to us from Mars. Remember, the sky is not the limit. Thank you very much.